Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Delighted to see you here. I'm Merit Jane O'Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome you to the 2017 Ambassador Donald and Vera Blinken Lecture on Global Governance, um, which will be delivered tonight by Dr. Hoyer, the President of the European Investment Bank. I'm very grateful to Donald and Vera Blinken for sponsoring this lecture series and for being with us uh, here tonight and for their commitment uh, to the study of Europe as well as this ongoing discourse around issues facing uh, the world and global governance. Uh, the Center on Global Economic Governance, chaired and run by Jan Svenor, uh, is a forum uh, for examination and analysis of critical economic and global governance uh, issues. Uh, we routinely organize high-level academic and policy discussions with the aim of developing uh, nuanced and in-depth research uh, that will enhance our understanding of pressing global issues and to help shape uh, policy and political debate at home and around the world. Um, tonight's subject is one of tremendous importance to SIPA and the Columbia community and one that our students are deeply engaging, uh, which is the current situation and future prospects uh, for the European economies. And who would be better to address this subject uh, than Dr. Hoyer, President of the uh, European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank functions as the bank for the European Union it's owned by and represents the, the interests of the EU member states, and um, I, I believe that more than 90% of its activity is in Europe, but the president will, will correct me. Uh, he was appointed, Dr. Hoyer, to this position in January of 2012, and prior to leading the bank, he served as Minister of State, Deputy Foreign Minister at the German Foreign Office. He was a member of the Bundestag for nearly 25 years, if I'm not mistaken, and for a time served as president of the European Liberal Democratic Reform Party. Uh, in the wonderful tradition that we value greatly here at Columbia, he has a PhD as well uh, in economics uh, from Cologne University, where he was also a lecturer. We're enormously grateful to have you with us uh, tonight, and we look forward to your remarks. And following his speech, Dr. Hoyer has agreed to take some questions uh, from our students and faculty uh, with us this evening. And moderating that discussion uh, will be Professor Jan Svenar, uh, Director of the Center on Global Economic Governance and the James Shotwell Professor of Global Political Economy uh, at SIPA. He is also the founder and chairman of a program in economics that educates economists for Central and Eastern European Europe and the newly independent states. He's the 2015 uh, awardee of the ESA Prize in Le Labor Economics from the Institute for the Study of Labor uh, based in Bonn, and in 2008 was one of the candidates for the presidency of the Czech Republic. So uh, I think to further uh, introduce Dr. Hoyer and tell a little bit more about our areas of collaboration, I invite Jan uh, to offer a few more uh, introductory welcome. Thank you, thank you, Merit, and thank you, Dr. Hoyer, for coming here, Ambassador in uh, Vera Blinken. Uh, I'd like to just say a few words so that you realize that the European Investment Bank actually is really a tremendous vehicle in terms of infrastructure and other types of projects in Europe. It's much larger than the World Bank, and actually 10% of its activities are outside, are, are worldwide, so it's very important. And it's a real pleasure for us to actually be able to cooperate with them. We've been cooperating on number, uh, in a number of areas. We actually sponsored a conference in Marrakesh uh, last year jointly together. We sponsored a conference here that was hosted by the Societe Generale in downtown. We're planning another conference together. And the bank has a very lively research department uh, led by Deborah Revoltella, who gave a lecture here last year as well. So there are a number of activities that we are collaborating on in terms of research itself, in terms of uh, events that are important from a policy standpoint. For instance, the event here on Europe last year brought in leading policymakers from Europe. 
leading academics and policymakers from the US, and there was a very frank discussion of uh, the situation in Europe, and it's a great pleasure actually to have uh, President Hoyer with us today to bring us up to date and show us uh, the uh, directions of future developments of Europe. President Hoyer, the floor is yours. Professor Jano, Professor Swainar, Ambassador Blinken, Madam Blinken, it's a great honor to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say uh, being invited to the place where the world meets uh, is very exciting. And to do it in, this, in these times is particularly exciting. Uh, if, we, if you have a, an opportunity, the unique opportunity to deliver a speech as part of the Ambassador Donald and Vera Blinken Lecture Series on Global Governance. It is a particular distinction to be a speaker for the lecture series dedicated to the Blinken family, uh, who carried out a path-breaking work in international relations during their diplomatic mission, in particular the mid-90s in Hungary, which we in Central Europe will not forget. Only five years into the country's transformation from democracy uh, towards democracy and, and market economy. And in addition, they also generously support academic research on international, chiefly European affairs at Columbia University and also by providing funding to the Open Society Archives of the Central European University in Budapest, where it's worthwhile to look at concretely and precisely right now. Uh, uh, the Central European University is certainly being one of the key repositories of post-war European history. We cannot be grateful enough for the example and generosity, and I cannot be grateful enough for the two of you being here tonight. That's a special honor and uh, pleasure for me. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, as a matter of fact, just two weeks ago, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Treaties of Rome, which also marks the creation of the EIB, the EU Bank as we say nowadays. This is a good time to reflect on Europe's history to the, of these past 60 years, which represents a tremendous achievement in terms of institutional innovation, economic stability, and multilateral cooperation that delivers peace, productivity, and prosperity. For the younger people, not only here, but in particular in Europe itself, all these achievements are being taken for granted nowadays. When a collaborator of mine who has moved to Luxembourg with me, is now my chief of staff there, uh, went on vacation last summer, and they still lived in Berlin at that time, they went to the Dutch coast, and after four hours of driving, he said to his eight, six, and five-year-old kids, oh, we had just passed the border to the Netherlands. And the eight-year-old asked, Daddy, what is a border? <laughs> Presently, one is reminded of what a border is, in particular when on a Sunday evening like yesterday you tried to move into the United States. This, these 60 years have brought about tremendous progress. And I will elaborate a little bit on the, the dangers for this progress in these times, and that we should not take everything for granted. Because in spite of such achievements, or perhaps because they formed such a solid bedrock, today Europe faces considerable challenges. Chief among them is a destabilizing sense of uncertainty that has loomed over us since the beginning of the global financial and sovereign crisis. Initially, initially, this uncertainty plagued the economic outlook, but over time spread to the realms of policy and politics. Brexit confirmed the severity of the disenchantment and showed us that the, Europe's, the European Union's narrative of multilateralism and openness no longer connected with important parts of the population. Some European citizens simply take for granted what Europe represents, in particular in terms of values. Further, destabilization of the challenges of migration linked to crises in the EU's neighborhood and beyond 
and those posed by climate change. As we know, the vicious circle between uncertainty and its harmful effect on economic activity can be persistent. Our living standards depend on our ability to sustain stable, thriving, and innovative economies. And in turn, this ability rests on the capacity of both market forces and, when needed, public institutions to foster high-quality investments. Investments which, in turn, provide us with confidence in our prospects. Against this background, I will cover three topics in my speech today. First, I will talk about the macroeconomic outlook in Europe and the key challenges that we are likely to face in the coming years. Second, I would like to share some of my thoughts on the institutional turning point that the European Union is experiencing at the moment and which has been the theme of the European Commission's white paper on the future of the European Union recently. And finally, I will elaborate on the role of investment and explain how the European Investment Bank, as the EU Bank, can contribute to the success and the prosperity of the citizens of Europe. And before I do that, I need to explain what kind of an institution I'm chairing. The European Investment Bank is an integral part of the Treaties of Rome, and that means nowadays the Treaty of, of Lisbon. It has been founded at that time by the then six to be members of the European Economic Community and Euratom, mainly with the purpose in two directions. Number one, contributing to the restoration of the completely destroyed infrastructure in Europe after World War II. But that was cast into treaty provisions, which say, is at first glance, a somewhat different thing. They say the EU Bank, the EIB, should contribute to the forming of an internal market, what we say in modern language today, developing an internal market. And to be quite clear, this job has not been done. We are extremely proud in Europe of the achievements there and the strength of Europe as a player, economic player in the world. Some people say an economic giant, but a political dwarf. But if you look at it more precisely, you find out that only 50% of the EU's GDP are produced and distributed along the rules of the common market. The rest is still subject to national or regional legislation. So there is still a lot of maneuver space in the forming of the internal market, in particular when it comes to issues like services. Our well, services are certainly not unimportant. If you, nowadays, everybody looks at the figures for the United Kingdom, what might they lose, what they, might they achieve, where are their strengths and where are their weaknesses, and you see that services are by far the biggest export factor for the United Kingdom. I mean, deindustrialization has gone very far in the United Kingdom, so services naturally is the key area. And there, we still operate more or less under the rules of national legislation. And the second objective that is mentioned in the treaty is the leveling out of development differences between the different parts of the then six countries. That was the Benelux countries plus France, Italy, and Germany at that time. And it's obvious, if you think about regions of these six countries that were left behind at that time, you will arrive easily in the south of Italy, the Mezzogiorno, which did not benefit as much as the other parts of Europe from the blessings of the Marshall Plan after World War II. Therefore, by the way, the first idea was not to set up a bank, but a special fund in parallel to the Marshall Fund in order to serve the disadvantaged regions of the upcoming European community. But that was buried uh, very quickly by the governments in Paris and Bonn at that time because they thought, well, maybe this is only a traditional challenge, but regional differences and lacks in the completion or development of the common market might persist, so we better set up a bank with a longer-term perspective. So that's why the, the six at that time founded the bank. This bank, of course, is now owned by 28. It cooperates very closely with the European Commission. And, of course, 
under the aegis of the legislators, which is the European construction, as you know, the European Parliament and the European Council. But it is important to see we are owned by the member states, not by the European Commission. This becomes important when you come to concrete cases. So everything you hear about over-regulation and uh, concentration of powers with uh, commission services, not the commissioners, they're not the problem, but the services of this huge bureaucracy are a problem sometimes, does not automatically apply to the bank because we are not part of that setup. We are also not part of the Brussels setup because after 10 years, in 1968, the bank moved to Luxembourg. Of course, you all know Luxembourg. It's a wonderful, tiny place. It's, the country has close to 500,000 500, people. The city has 85,000 people. Nowadays, with an additional 185,000 commuting into the city every day from the neighboring countries. So most of our employees live in France, in Germany, in Belgium, uh, and of course in the countryside in Luxembourg. It's a unique place. How did this place become the center of the financial and, by the way, also legal activities of the European Union? Well, because in the 60s, people were negotiating the future capital of the European communities, or later European Union. And Luxembourg got the offer. And under the pressure from the church, the archbishop was of the opinion that these thousands and thousands of bachelors roaming the city would bring Sodom and Gomorrah. They decided against it and negotiated instead to be the center of the administration of the parliament in the part of the European Commission, but in particular the seat of the bank and the seat of the Court of Auditors, the seat of the Court of Justice, and the second court as well. So this is why the Luxembourgers fared quite well. A little less trouble than the people in Brussels and in Strasbourg have, but uh, quite a bit of purchasing power in a city of only 85,000 people. We all realize that, Professor Sweiner, when your friends in, your, in our economics department made a study recently about uh, certain contributions of member states to overall output in Europe by GDP. And uh, we found that, I mean, Luxembourg was just fascinatingly high. But the fact is that most of the GDP of Luxembourg is produced by people who don't live in Luxembourg because they move in every day. So it's a little bit misleading. This bank is now, as you kindly said, the biggest multilateral lender in the world. The lending volume per year, roughly 85 billion euros. Balance sheet, a little under 600 billion euros, or to be exact, nowadays 600 billion dollars. Uh, and since we don't get public funds, uh, we rely completely on the capital markets. So without the sale of EIB bonds between 70 and 90 billion euros per year, we could not survive. This, in turn, requires a strong standing on the capital markets because you must have some argument to convince or persuade your investors to invest into these bonds. Now, they do that only if they have the feeling that they might get their money back and, as I sometimes have to insist vis-a-vis -vis my shareholders, also with interest. So we are a bank. We are a bank, we are a bank, but at the same time we are a political institution because we are founded by the treaty and our objective is to support the European Union. Nowadays, one would not limit it so narrowly to the question of the development of the common market and the leveling out of regional differences. Our policy objectives nowadays are more set by decisions of the European Council, the highest decision-making body of the European Union, if you take the legislators apart. And that means the objective setting is getting very modern and up-to-date. And it's probably quite interesting for bringing about contributions to political developments which keep us busy presently. And it's reflected in the composition of the, the lending activity. In 1957, 58, nobody would have thought about SME financing. That was simply not on the agenda. 
But nowadays, where access to finance for the very smallest of companies is a big issue, beyond what we do in the field of microfinancing, in particular outside the European Union, within the European Union, 30% and more of our lending goes to SMEs via correspondent banks in the member state of the European Union, because that is a huge issue, access to finance. By the way, don't get me wrong, not necessarily in those countries which you would have under suspicion of being particularly weak or vulnerable. It is not, let's say, Greece or Portugal or, until recently, Ireland or, or Spain. No. One of the weakest countries when it comes to SME finance is the Netherlands, one of the most successful economies in the European Union. But the banking system has simply developed in a way that it has become very difficult, costly, and not attractive for the banks to give a special priority for, for SMEs. So even there, there is a need to come in and close the market gap. This SME financing. The second big topic on the European agenda is innovation. I'll come back to it later. Innovation financing is a big need, and therefore we do roughly 50% of our lending in innovation. The third big issue is the financing of energy efficiency, renewable energies, and climate change activities. That is, and we were the avant-garde among the multilateral development banks in the, in the preparation of COP21, uh, more than 25% of the lending. All the lending that is climate, real, all the lending of the bank is to have at least 25% climate change related. Outside the European Union, 35%. So it's, it's a huge, important thing. And I say this quite clearly, we will stick to that. Because we had been given a clear mandate, which we went for, and I risked some battles with other financial institutions in the world on this, because we at that time said, if our member states, together with more than 150 other member states of the United Nations, go to New York this year to ratify, or to at least sign up to the Sustainable Development Goals, and the same year we'll go to Paris to come to an agreement on COP21, then the multilateral banks must be a key part of this. Not because we are so fantastic value-oriented human beings, but because these objectives that has, have been set at the United Nations Summit for Sustainable Development Goals and at COP21 can only be achieved if we are able to mobilize the private sector. In order to, pro to mobilize the private sector, you need financial institutions which consider themselves crowding in institutions. The idea of a public bank, in my very fundamental view, should not be to crowd out private banks or commercial banks. If they can do a job, that's fine. Let them do it. We must go where the market gaps or market failures are. But in addition to that, where we are active, or must be active, we will never succeed if we don't get the private sector on board. So you need to develop products, financial instruments, which make it attractive to the private sector to come in. And this is our major raison d'etre as the EU bank, and I'll come back to that as well. So the strong position on the funding markets and the AAA rating that we so far enjoy makes it possible to borrow this money at very reasonable rates and pass this financial advantage on to the fund recipients of the loans, which therefore borrow at much, much lower cost than they would have to do on the capital markets or with commercial banks. This financial advantage over the last five years that was forwarded, forwarded from the bank to the final recipients of the loans amounted to 17 billion euros, almost 20 billion dollars. So this is quite remarkable. And in the context of Brexit, that will play a role because that is the advantage that every member state of the European Union draws out of a bank from which this country does not receive dividends. Because when it comes to dividends, we are quite clumsy. 
The purpose of the bank is not to distribute profits. This does not mean that the bank should not go for positive P&L. Of course, we, we are in competition with others and need to be as efficient as, as possible, but that serves exclusively the Treasury and the, the building up of reserves, which make it unnecessary during a phase in particular where the bank has been growing in exponentially over the last decades to go to the shareholders and ask for capital increases. We only had one capital increase in the entire time. That was four years ago when I came to the bank and uh, after the financial crisis, first round, so to speak, I had to tell my shareholders uh, if we want to preserve decent balance sheet criteria, we better reduce the lending by 50% or give a capital injection. So they opted for the latter and have never regretted it. This is the actual situation of the bank, and now a few words on the economic outlook and challenges. Let me, provide, let me begin by providing a background on the economic situation. The good news is that after many years of stagnation and weak growth, the economic recovery in Europe looks ever healthier as it firms and broadens, with domestic demand driving growth at labor markets continuously improving. External demand has there been an important factor, especially in the early phase of the recovery, as crisis hit economies complete their adjustment and improve their competitiveness. Although the recent pickup in global growth is still fairly modest by historical standards, we can finally say that the state of the global economy is not a barrier anymore for the recovery in Europe. In recent years, emerging markets have picked up much of the slack in the global economy, notably China and India, which continue to grow at rates in excess of 6 and 7 percent. Further, a mild rise in energy prices has given some succor to some commodities exporters that had struggled until recently, such as Russia, Brazil, and South Africa. That being said, maybe a little bit too positive, the average growth of the world economy is projected to increase from below 3 percent to close to 3.5 percent in the coming years, but it is still considerably below the 4 percent average of the pre-crisis pre decades. Global trade continues to weaken, reflecting the fact that global value chains are developing much more slowly, if at all, than before the crisis. As such, while I firmly believe that going forward, an important factor will be global coordination and the strength of multilateral institutions, recent lack of commitment at G20 level to free trade can only add to concerns in this regard. As was today witnessed also by the G7 meeting, which was unable to come to common formula on climate change mitigation. Indeed, this is an important factor to take into consideration when evaluating the impact of the widely expected expansionist U.S. fiscal stance. Certainly, it is expected to stimulate domestic demand and, in particular, investment. Yet, what it means for the global, global economy is increasingly unclear. If the U.S. weakens its commitment to multilateralism and its institutions, by seeking out bilateral agreements and enforcing protectionist measures, then this will make the global cake smaller, but not larger. I mean, basically, this is classical economic theory, which we have been working on and thinking about for the last more than 200 years. And it's quite uh, irritating that it takes so long to get back to the learning curve on this issue. An agenda where protectionist measures such as tariffs even worse, non-tariff barriers are used to promote domestic investment to deal a severe blow to the progress made over recent decades. To us in the EU, which is based on multilateralism and freedom of movement, this is anathema. Notwithstanding this mixed external picture, GDP growth in Europe is expected to strengthen modestly and most analysts project a growth rate between 1.5 and 2% for the next years, mainly fueled this time by a robust growth in domestic demand. Yet, despite the prevailing high liquidity, low rate environment, 
investment critical to potential growth and competitiveness has remained low and uneven across EU member states, especially for SMEs, RDI, and infrastructures. Even if gross, if real gross fixed capital formation has contributed 28% to EU real GDP growth since 2013, by end 2016 it remained roughly 6.5% below the 2008 level. And this was the starting point of the discussion for the so-called Juncker plan, the investment plan for Europe, four years ago or three years ago when it then was decided. The basic idea came about when the person who later became candidate for the presidency of the European Commission had just been ousted as Prime Minister of Luxembourg after more than 20 years there, or a felt, subjectively felt century. And I mean, Mr. Juncker was Prime Minister of Luxembourg for most people forever. Now, all of a sudden he was out of office and was considering a bid for the presidency for his party, the European People's Party, to run the European Commission. And uh, you can imagine that somebody who has been for 100 years finance minister and prime minister of Luxembourg knows the Luxembourg-based EU bank very well. So uh, he was leading the opposition in the Chambre of, of dep Deputies in, in Luxembourg, which is not an ex exciting full-time job, I guess. So he came to the bank and wanted to get ammunition for his candidacy for the European Commission presidency. And he asked us where we would believe that key areas of potential activity in order to restart the growth engine in Europe would be. So we developed a couple of studies led by your colleagues, which you have mentioned, Deborah Revoltella, our chief economist. And they, first of all, identified an incredible investment gap in Europe since the beginning of the financial crisis. Now, how do you measure an investment gap well, as a political institution, which is bound by political objectives, you look at the objectives, quantify them, and compare with what's on the table. In other words, see what the European Council has decided as objectives for RDI, education, improving of infrastructure, SME financing, for the period at least until 2020, and then look at public budgets and corporate budgets what is in there in order to achieve these objectives. And you, find, you found horrifying figures. There was 65 billion not existent for reaching the digital goals which we have per year. There was 110 as a gap for RDI financing and you can go through the entire political menu and you arrive, or we arrived, at an investment gap in Europe of annually 700 billion euros. That was then compared to the, uh, well, brought in contact with the question, do, do projects is exist? Would we be able to fill that gap with sustainable and economically viable, these are our main conditions, projects? And, you know, we made an analysis upon request of the, of the Council of Ministers, the ECOFIN Council, and we found out that the member states and other interested groups, persons, sources would come up with ideas, what should be financed in Europe, where's, where's, where's the investment gap? And as you can imagine, you get proposals for investment activities, which you find familiar. Because on this list was everything that everybody always wanted to have financed, but for very good reasons, nobody was ready to finance. Because the projects were simply not good enough, or not sustainable, or not economically viable. So we had to slim it down to what is the real core of the investment that, that could be serviced. And still you arrive at a volume of more than 2,000 billion euros that could be brought into place. Now you look at these sums of investment needs and you look at the liquidity situation in Europe. Other than a couple of years before when we, had the, when we needed the capital increase, at that time, two and three years ago, liquidity was not the issue anymore in Europe. We are swimming, like the United States, we are swimming in liquidity. So if liquidity is abundantly available and the investment needs are so high, why does that money not find its way towards these projects? 
Well, obviously, because the economic climate, the confidence of the potential in project promoters, and the risk aversion of the promoters lead to a certain uh, wait and see mentality of people. So one would have to, have to help these people over the hurdle, to taking an investment decision, though, although the risk might be seen a little bit too high. So the trick there was to invent a formula by which, so to speak, the public goes into the boat with the investors by promising if your concerns turn out to be right and that project goes foul, we'll take a first piece of the loss, reducing your risk. And that did it. So the Juncker plan is now full in swing. We have targeted a volume of additionally triggered investment of 315 billion. So far, it has worked. After half the way, we are at 58% of the target. So it works. Minor difficulties, but that is internal cuisine. However, that has covered now, if you look at it, 315 billion for three years, so roughly 100 billion per year, reduced the investment gap by 600 billion. So we are not there yet. <coughs> and it takes another change in the political landscape in Europe, an encouragement of people by restoring confidence and by reducing bureaucratic and administrative burdens and costs in order to strengthen the investment machine in Europe overall. In the, in the European public, people only speak about this guarantee facility that has been founded with the Juncker plan, European Fund for Strategic Investment, which is ready to cover the first loss piece. But people are not talking about what is really important to reduce the investment gap further from 600 to 400, 200 maybe completely, and that is the restoration of confidence and the removal of administrative and non-administrative barriers to investment in Europe. This is the job that still is a little bit, a little bit lagging behind, but we are aware that it is, that it is key. So, uh, many governments and households, of course, face fiscal constraints, while many banks remain constrained by legacy assets. Unsurprisingly, then, the construction sector accounts for the largest share of the accumulated investment gap, with the lack of infrastructure investment a particularly important concern, as it is the conduit for all of our interactions and the basic basis of our productivity and wealth. And if I say this in the United States and look at the infrastructure here, I would say it sounds familiar, doesn't it? On the other hand, with corporates leading the investment recovery, EIB survey data shows that firms continue to focus on rebuilding capital stocks, and that uncertainty and availability of staff are the main barriers to investment. We have a considerable mismatch between qualifications of people and needed qualifications of people. It is not so that the 20% or 25% of unemployed young people in Spain are not qualified. They are, as we call it, to a large extent, chômeurs diplômés. People which, which are at the same time jobless, but with a perfect diploma or PhD thesis behind. So the preparation for the labor market has not been very targeted in Europe over the last decades, and that's the bill that is going to be presented now. And if I may make a political prediction, in the elections campaigns that are coming up this year and next year, this will be a key issue. Youth unemployment will come back. We already had launched a big program on youth unemployment by addressing the skills problem and by addressing the, the, the challenges of vocational training. And uh, we have spent, uh, in the first year of that program in, nine, in 2013, uh, 60 billion euros on that. Uh, I think these activities will come back. Watch it. Youth unemployment will be back on stage. Unemployment in general is receding, but youth unemployment is going to be back. When it comes to RDI, Europe is still lagging behind. And although we intend to increase our spending as proposed or as promised to 3% of GDP, this will merely mean that we can keep up with the US, Japan, and emerging players like China and Korea. And of course, we see that the difference in Europe are enormous uh, because there are some uh, outstanding examples of, of high RDI activity with a strongly boost, strong boost for 
uh, productivity recovery, and other countries are far behind, and we must work on this. At the EIB, we stand ready to address this issue with particular concern, as we recognize that innovative activities call for a financing mix that matches the risk and balance sheet profile, notably of young firms that are not rich, rich in fixed assets. Against this background, let me highlight a few of the challenges that I believe we face both globally and in the EU. I already mentioned political uncertainty. We are not talking about the type of financial sector uncertainty that grabbed our minds over the last decades. Decade, as I believe we have now achieved a certain degree of financial stability. Rather, it is something much deeper, a sense of disenchantment and disengagement by our institutions and their processes. Indeed, perhaps it is the sense of having restored stability and even growth, but having overlooked of what, at what cost for the common citizen. We cannot champion competition and openness as enhancing global welfare unless we install mechanisms to ensure inclusiveness as well as protection of the weakest in society. Looking ahead, in a world where technological frontiers are shifting swiftly, ensuring that the working age population remain, uh, maintains adequate and up-to-date skill sets is as much an economic as a social challenge. In fact, constant developments leave many members of Western societies feeling left behind by economic growth. A major challenge for European and probably global econo economies is thus to make economic growth more inclusive, ensuring equal opportunity and social mobility. As I've already alluded to, the advent of populist and protectionist governments in Western countries capitalizes on the lack of such opportunities and social mobility and is therefore symptomatic of the misinformed global backlash against multilateral and open economies. At the EU, we take this very seriously as our history of the past 60 years is founded of, on the multilateral principle, on the belief of high international coordination and the role of multilateral and global institutions, considering them fundamental to functioning global economy. Another challenge we face in the coming months and years is the fact that a sustained period of unusually loose monetary policies appear to be coming to an end. Although in itself this is rather welcome, it does entail risks, risks that will increase with the extent, extent to which central banks to normalize monetary policy in an asynchronous, asynchronous, asynchronous manner. You know what I mean at least. An important question will therefore be the sequencing of, of tightening, while the manner in which unconventional monetary policies can be unwound including the possibility of ad hoc measures remains rather ill-defined. And that means probably that the European Central Bank will not be able and would probably not be very well advised to follow the Fed too quickly because the investment cycle in Europe is also not following uh, the American investment cycle with uh, full synchronization. So from that point of view, I would not think that even if something happens this year, as expected with the Fed, it will lead to an immediate change, of course, in, in Europe. This has to be done more over time and cautiously in order not to rock the markets. Indeed, related to the previous point on multilateralism, the room for accidents with uncoordinated or even competitive strategies may be considerable, and economies that have loaded up an external debt such as some European ones, are historically vulnerable in such circumstances. I we turn to the question of the EU at crossroads, the historic crossroad where the EU is at the moment of, from, an inter, in, from an institutional viewpoint. The European Union is an immensely successful and historic achievement. It is home to the world's largest single market, the second biggest currency, and in, it is the world's largest trade power. By the way, it's also by far the largest contributor to international development assistance. They also, also, the EU remains extremely robust even when, or I dare say, especially when required to change with the times. When you think only about the last 20 years, transformation, Ambassador Blinken has taken at a tremendous pace. The introduction of the currency, the integration of the former Eastern Bloc countries, 
and then the rapid response to the crisis with measure, measures such as the banking union to deepen and strengthen the euro area. And the EU also provides a lot to the daily life of its citizens, first and foremost, and this seems to be overlooked sometimes, it has been delivering peace, stability, of freedom for a longer period in Europe than ever experienced in history. But it also delivers hassle-free movement through national borders for the 1.7 million people who commute from one country to another every day, and for the hundreds of millions who travel for other purposes each year. It allows European citizens to enjoy many benefits of the single market, cheaper goods, more reliable services, interconnected and integrated transport, and telecommunication systems. Nevertheless, the aftermath of the financial crisis brought many dormant problems to the surface. The aging of European societies, the growing inequality between various parts of the society, structural problems leading to unemployment, for instance. These developments led many citizens to raise doubts about the EU's ability to deliver on its promises, and in member states, we can observe signs of indifference, mistrust, and growing discontent towards mainstream politics. Exploiting these feelings, there is an emergence of populist and discriminatory rhetoric in the political field. It's no different in Europe than here. The process that led to Brexit showed how dangerous it can be when the EU is used as a scapegoat for all kinds of troubles and the European Union is indeed, is indeed an easy target for finger, finger pointing. And this is something that is not concentrated on the United Kingdom alone. It's everywhere. And it has a tradition because at the beginning of the integration process, people were told and convinced that the integration process is a win-win situation. It's not a zero-sum game. And I was told one day by the former Italian Prime Minister Monti when we were sitting on a panel together, he said, Rana, if I look back to my career, when I went as Prime Minister of Italy to a European Council, we would all bring each time a brick. And we would use our bricks to over time build a house. Quite an impressive building by now. Nowadays, everyone goes to the European Council, either in order to take a brick away or to make sure that he gets at least a better deal than the other, or even a deal at the expense of the other. So in the press conferences after European Councils nowadays, the decisions of the European Council are not presented in the spirit of win-win situations, but who has prevailed over the other. And this is producing a lot of disconnect because it doesn't necessarily support the idea of the Union in general. And then you have the, the great experience, uh, and I had it in many, many years in the cabinet, both of Helmut Kohl and Angela Merkel, that there is a tendency to say, well, basically everything that works in Europe is due to the genial performance of our national politicians. And everything that might, but might be a little bit less optimal is due to the bureaucrats in Brussels. So the scapegoating exercise, the blame game, is always against the EU institutions and not against anything that might have gone wrong on the national level. And this is something that over time destroys the union. So therefore, not only communicators, but also politicians themselves must change the way they present their successes to the European audiences. I strongly believe that Europeans profoundly agree with the fundamental idea and principles of the Union. They strongly support the EU project and see it as a cornerstone of stability. And after the Trump election and the Brexit, one thing has changed fundamentally. And you could see it over the last month and weeks, every Sunday, on the streets of Europe. This Sunday, in 60 big cities in Europe. People go to the streets for Europe. This is unusual. In my country, you have a long tradition of huge demonstrations, but it's always against something. This time, after Brexit, and the effect of Brexit on young people in particular, people are going to the streets that we do not want this to be taken away from us. We get, go to the streets, take to the streets for European integration. If you look at the, at the uh, YouTube or other places in the media these days on the demonstration by hometown in, in Cologne, 
there was a huge movement in front of the big cathedral, and people were holding big boards in red, white, and blue, representing not the American, but the French colors, holding it up, showing to the French people by television the, the, the flag of the French Republic. And then at one moment, they turned it and showed the blue flag of the European Union with 12 stars on it. Very impressive movement of young people, and this is now taking place with 100,000 of people every weekend. So there is some hope that people are, people are waking up, and that Brexit and the result in the United States has led to a wake-up call in Europe, and I think it's urgently necessary in order to restore trust also in the institutional framework of the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I skip a few remarks here because I do not want to be too long, uh, because I would like to say at the end a few words what the bank can do. The role of investment in strengthening Europe and the contribution of the EU bank to the solution for some of the challenges mentioned. To prevail, the European Union, with its multilateral institutions and cooperative values, must recast a strong, persuasive, and inspiring narrative that connects with our citizens and business community in a real, tangible, and inclusive manner. This is all the more important because the old narrative does not reach the young people anymore, because it's too much past-oriented. If you look in the, into the future and say, where will Europe, where will the nation of the European Union stand in the global competition in the next decades, it becomes obvious that the future perspective of my kids will completely depend on the way we deal with Europe. And we bring us into the position of being a global player, economically and also politically. We are doing I think a considerable uh, contribution to this, and we will be the driving force behind the modernization of European industry by research, development, and innovative activities of companies and societies. Second, by our strong in activity in the field of environment and climate change mitigation. And uh, last, but by no means least, by investing into the infrastructure of Europe, which is lagging so far behind. By the way, an issue I've discussed many times in Washington, where the question of the institutional setup of an American infrastructure investment bank has, not, has still not been resolved. And uh, after many attempts, I just remember uh, Senator Kerry at that time, or Senator Warner until recently, this has, this has died down, but I don't have the feeling that the situation of the infrastructure in the United States has particularly improved. So uh, we are going to be helpful for the European Union, but also in our co cooperation with other countries around the world. You were kind enough to say that we do 10% of the activities outside the European Union. And uh, I must say, Professor Swenner, when, when I first attended the meeting of the multilateral development banks in Washington, and because of rotation, I had to take the chair there. I felt a little bit odd man out, because there were these great development institutions, and there comes the bank that is, although being by far the biggest one, is only with 10% of the activities outside the European Union. And they, some of them didn't really want to know what kind of experience one can bring from, from intra-investment promotion to external activities and development. Ladies and gentlemen, this has changed. As I said at the beginning, without mobilizing the private sector, we will not be able to meet climate change goals nor sustainable development goals. And that requires a new cooperation also with the multilateral financing institutions. And nowadays, we are not odd men out anymore. We are part of, an ins of, of a big effort that has to be carried on notwithstanding irritations that here and there come about politically. And uh, even when it comes to the United Kingdom, I would like to remind ourselves that this country is not only a strong shareholder of the bank and will cease to be, unfortunately. It is also the holder of a fantastic portfolio of the European Investment Bank and products that, give, that shed very positive light on our balance sheet. It is also the country that has line share in development financing among the European countries. So it is also a 
challenge to the rest of the European Union to take development and our neighborhood a little bit closer into focus and uh, do it with instruments that have been tested elsewhere, including inside the European Union, but with the same spirit of multilateralism, of tolerance, of freedom that have been the sources of success for the European Union for the last 60 years. Thank you so much. I'll start maybe with one, and then uh, I would like to actually ask uh, Ambassador Blinken, since uh, uh, it's thanks to him and uh, his wife that we have this lecture series, uh, to maybe ask the next question, and then we'll open it up. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, for us, Europe is one of the major focal points for the Center on Global Economic Governance. It's uh, important per se, but it is uh, almost a quarter of the world economy, and how it does is extremely important. Uh, and indeed, uh, last year, when your uh, predecessor here, uh, German finance minister Schäuble was here, uh, the mood was one where Europe still was not growing overall and so on. Same thing when we were in the fall doing the joint conference with Societe Generale, where the uh, uh, best American and European academics policymakers were comparing notes and saying, uh, um, the Europeans, in some sense, were saying, uh, look, we're really progressing towards uh, a banking union, a stability mechanism, and so on and so forth. And the Americans, uh, looking at the same uh, picture, were saying that's very, very good, but in some sense, the problems are becoming more and more serious. Um, now, of course, uh, with Europe growing, it's a much more optimistic picture with all the caveats that you've mentioned. Um, I would like to maybe start by asking you a question which is kind of gives a historical flavor and your institution being a historical institution with the birth and evolution of the European Union obviously has an important perspective and a lot to do with it. Um, you know, until the late 1980s, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, the feeling was that Europe has pretty much caught up in terms of economic development with the United States and the question was where it was going to overtake. Right? And that was the discussion. Similar one with Japan, incidentally. Uh, and then the following two, two and a half decades have changed that perception dramatically. And one aspect that uh, has um, made the difference where the US moved rapidly ahead, or more rapidly, let's say, than uh, Europe or Japan, respectively, was the birth of the new technology and the new companies and young people being the driving force, you know, the Amazons, Googles, Facebooks, and so on. And Europe, in a way, if one puts it starkly, missed the boat, right? It, you really don't see those kinds of companies in the sector there. And the investment in that area and the research development going with it is very important. What's your view on that? Why did it happen? Is it changing? Is your bank's um, uh, orientation, in fact, uh, helping to that? And is that going to be where Europe uh, will, in fact, uh, become a driving force in the future? I believe we can be helpful in order to, to fix or relativate the problem. But first, the analysis is right. We somehow missed the boat in, in the 90s. Uh, well, one can say that at that time, we had a more bigger challenge to meet. And more, more and more, I come to the conclusion we met it quite well. If I go to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, which until then were under the firm grip of the Soviets, uh, there is no doubt in these countries that this is the perspective for the future for them. So, uh, and after Brexit, you don't even hear uh, ideas being flagged what, that one could maybe have a better life in, in uh, Slovenia or in Poland uh, outside the European Union. Even in Poland, where the political situation is not easy, uh, the, the desire to, to get out of the European family is, is very, very, very low. That's encouraging. On the other hand, we should not hide behind that uh, fact and this challenge at that time we had to shoulder, in particular also in my own country. Uh, basically, uh, we, we integrated within a few years 18 million people from, from the East in a system which was completely new to them. And uh, at the end of the day, it worked. But now, uh, I, I must say, indeed, uh, we have lost too much time on education, research and development, and innovation. In addition to that, we are a little bit, I don't say were, but are a little bit stuck 
in the regulatory framework in which we live. Take, for instance, uh, the support for innovative activities, development of, of new products. If you look around the, so to speak, the Apple world, a huge chunk of these technologies has been developed in Europe with the support of member states of the European Union. But for instance, competition law keeps us from helping these countries, the, the companies, in introducing their newly developed products into markets. So take, take an old system like the MP3 player. The MP3 player is in EU development. But of course it was introduced in, in, in Korea, in, in Japan, in China, in the US, everywhere, but not in Europe. And I could give you examples for this from morning to night. Uh, that means that we have to make sure that we don't stumble over our own hurdles, and that we pave the way for companies not only to be successful in inventing and developing new things, but also in introducing them into the markets and making it market successes. There we are still wrong. But all in all, um, I agree that uh, we must catch up quickly. There are some technologies where we probably have lost to the Silicon Valley. There are others which still have not been decided. If you look at electromobility, for instance, that battle has not been lost yet. And the Europeans, however, are waking up very slowly. And it's time to wake up on this, because the standards will be set in the next couple of years. Now, on, from a positive side, uh, I'm a structural optimist, so when a development is negative, I always take the best out of it for the future. The, the, the trade agreement with, with um, Canada, and the ambassador just had to leave for, for another meeting, uh, is a very, very good story. And we could have translated that into something for, for TTIP in a similar way. I think the Canadians have had a much better strategy uh, than, than we in Europe and, and the, the US friends. But now the, the Pacific Agreement is dead, at least for the time being. This is a huge wake up call for the Europeans again because had the Pacific Agreement come into force one day, it would have left the Europeans far out in setting the technological standards for the next decades. Now, there is a new chance. Now, I just met Prime Minister Modi in, in, in Delhi and we talked about this issue. It's a new chance for the Europeans to approach, for instance, the Asian friends on, on the bilateral free trade agreements and investment agreements. Uh, the same with, with Latin America. I mean, the Europeans must take advantage of a situation that they were not responsible for, which is regrettable, but now should lead to uh, a more dynamic approach of EU policies. Very good, very good. All right, why don't we open it up, and I would like to ask Ambassador Blinken to actually start us off, and then uh, those of you who have questions, please. First, I'd like to uh, thank President Hoy for a wonderful lecture. You covered so much ground that the very complicated question I was going to ask you, I'm not going to ask you now because you really answered it in your talk. But I would like to know, based on your own observation of what's going on now and what you see in the next, say, five or ten years, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the trade-off between government power and the, and the market sector? Yeah, I'm... I'm uh I would love to, to postpone my answer to the day after the French elections. Because the French elections are going to decide whether the present upswing, which I see in Europe, will continue or not. If French elections goes completely wrong, then I'm wondering whether uh, it, the, the damage for the European integration process will not be very, very fundamental. But since I'm a structural optimist, again, I would say uh, let's assume after the result of the Dutch elections, also the French elections will produce a, a very multilateral oriented European modernization approach. Uh, then we can say 2016 was the annus horribilis. 2017 is the turning point. Because I can add that, I mean, you, we could see in the, the Dutch elections how people lost completely balance and perspective. I mean, if I read the international newspapers, not only outside Europe, but also in Europe, about the Dutch elections, you would have wondered whether Mr. Wilders with his nationalist movement would be shortly before the overall majority. I mean, Mr. Wilders got 13% of the votes in the Netherlands. 
and the rest went more or less to all democratic parties. Uh, let's hope that we see something similar in France. In Germany, I can assure you, whoever wins the elections, Germany will not get instable. This is not, not the point. And the question is, will the, the, a certain Merkel fatigue, which is normal after 12 years, uh, lead to the desire for a new uh, chancellor that could then lead to a, a rebalancing of the two big parties? The observation uh, I presently make is that uh, this return to more political thinking of the people, not in terms of politics, but of policies, has led to a strengthening of the center in, in, in Germany, where the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, and also the resurgent liberals, uh, will probably be quite successful this year, while the extremes uh, on, the, on the left, the, the former communists from East Germany, and on the right, this AfD, this uh, very, very conservative, nationalistic uh, party will fare much worse than anybody would, ex would have expected half a year ago. So if, if, these, if this series of elections this year comes about, then okay, we are, we are on, on a good track. What kind of consequences do we, do we draw from this in terms of modernization of our policies? That's a different question. Let me take the parallel to the decision of the European Central Bank to go into monetary easing a couple of years ago. Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, has basically saved a big part of European business and, and economy by giving the assurance of monetary policy to support the euro, whatever it takes, was his formulation. Whatever it takes. This has reassured the market in, markets in a way that nobody had expected. But what he had done was to buy time for the politicians. Has this time been properly used or taken advantage of? No. And if so, then very differentiated from country to country. Now, this policy will have to come to an end sooner or later. I indicated my expectation that it will take a little longer than in, the, in Europe than in the United States. And then we'll see who was prepared for a slight increase in interest rates or a tightening of monetary policy and who has not used the time to be prepared. And then we might stand before uh, big um, uh, turbulences again. So this is why I believe it's a very wise move to, to get some stability and stable development, even an upward development that could be stable into the system. <coughs> At the same time, the response to your question will depend, depend upon our capabilities of investing into the people, in particular in, in the young people. And our education system in most parts of Europe is dismal. You can look at some outstanding positive examples, for instance, Scandinavia and other countries. But all in all, if I go through the school buildings in my own, own wonderful old town of Cologne, I'm, I'm getting aggressive because uh, we simply don't give enough attention. And I'm not only talking about high-tech support and, and research and development. It begins with basics. These are the main challenges and the, the uh, Final challenge, not the least one, is how are we going to, to cope with demography? Um, migration is a huge issue. It is seen only as a negative one or a threat. If you look at it from the point of view of the, of the contribution of migration to productivity growth in Europe in the next years, it's a hugely positive contribution. And we must uh, deal with that problem in a decent manner as well. And that mean, leads to me to a to a completely different dimension which we must address, and I'm sorry to be so long, but uh, with an experienced ambassador, I, I don't want to, to lose it. When it comes to development policy, we in Europe, in most parts of Europe, including my own country, we have closed the eyes before the necessities. Now, in the context of migration, all of a sudden, people are realizing that we will very soon have a neighbor in Africa which will grow from one and a half billion to two and a half billion citizens with, to, at present, not very great economic perspectives. So we must also bring about a contribution to a change in the neighborhood, because Europe will not sleep well if the neighborhood does not develop well. And that means also in development, we need a paradigm change, like we had the paradigm change in the use of the EU budget from grants to guarantees, from subsidies to loans. We need something, something similar of a paradigm change 
developments from grant thinking and charity towards active support to develop economic perspectives and strategies for these countries. Uh, this is a big challenge, and I think the G20 will take it up now resolutely. Uh, we as the bank are strongly engaged in that. We have, have been asked to set up a resilience initiative for the southern neighborhood in the west of the Balkans. It's in full swing. Uh, the exposure of the multilateral banks in the eastern Mediterranean and the MENA region is roughly 100 billion euros of which we carry 40 billion alone. So there is a huge activity going on, but I think it must be further strengthened in order to make sure that Europe does not wake up one day because the situation in the neighborhood gets out of control. So this is the set of answers. I cannot give you a single one. It's quite a spectrum that one has to uh, develop. And indeed, it's a both short-term and a long-term uh, set of issues. I should just <laughs> highlight the fact that uh, a week from this Friday, uh, the Center on Global Economic Governance, together with the Brookings Institution, will be having a panel in Washington, D.C., about the upcoming French and actually German elections as well and what it means. It is on our radar screen and we are talking. So if one of you are going to be in D.C. and would like to attend, let me or David know there are front seats available. See you again. We have Professor exactly. Adma Desai, who is a specialist both on the on Russia and the Soviet system and the financial uh, sector. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, you have pointed out that there is almost total reliance on monetary policy for promoting growth, reducing high levels of unemployment in the European Monetary Union. Uh, Mario Draghi has brought down the short-term interest rate to negative levels so that borrowing and investment can take place. Would you suggest that there is absolutely no role for fiscal policy, budgetary spending in some of the northern tier countries like Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway for uh, reducing unemployment, promoting growth? No scope at all for fiscal policy, budgetary policy? Well, I, I do not want to, mis to be misunderstood because uh, I would not rely upon monetary policy. Uh, I, I applauded monetary policy a couple of years ago when Mario Draghi took these steps. But nowadays, we are living in a situation in Europe where monetary policy impulses do not get translated into economic activity anymore. Whether the interest rate is another 0.1% less or lower, below zero or not, will not make a big difference. The uh, incentivization of, of economic activities, in particular investment, will have to come from, from the other side. And therefore, I think the, uh, the removal of investment barriers is, is key there. The other question which you raised is, what can the, the better off countries and the northern countries do more? I agree that, uh, and I would like to see that the northern countries would take the present, well, success in their cleaning up of their budgets as a possibility, as a chance to contribute to an improvement of productivity growth in Europe, also through the improvement of infrastructure uh, and innovation. However, since I know the political cycle in most of the countries of my, my, my institution, I would say, especially in election years, the temptation is high to channel additional funding into consumptive measures. That would read, read completely to the wrong decisions. Uh, I believe that uh, my own country could and should do more in the field, and in all those fields, which at the end of the day give a, another boost to the to productivity and competitiveness of the European economy in the global context, then I would favor it very much. But the return to the old mistakes uh, and the, as a matter of fact, in many cases, even the winding down of successful reforms we had over the last 20 years in some European countries would be the wrong decision. And that's presently, for me, the biggest risk that that could happen. I suggest we have one more question with Professor Shanjin Wei, who just finished his tour of duty as the chief economist of the Asian Development Bank and is back with us here. A 
then I suggest we continue, but we'll do it over the bricks uh, outside. And uh, that sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, President. Oh yeah. Um, so my question is related to development bank uh, modeling. Um, yeah, uh, EIB has bigger portfolio than World Bank, and I think you have probably fewer staff, right? At least the the, the, the ratio of a long amount to staff is much lower, much higher for, for you. So I wonder when in, when you uh, look at the, in deciding on a project, reviewing a project, what kind of things World Bank does that you choose not to do to improve efficiency? Uh, and related questions, I mean, AIBs explicitly think EIB is a better model for them than uh, uh, either World Bank or other development uh, banks. You know, you probably have given advice to them. When you look at the AIB's performance uh, as of now, what other thing, what things they do right, what things they are not doing right? Well, um, I hesitate to lecture others who have different business profiles sometimes. Uh, the, uh, we, we cooperate very well in the, in the community of the of the uh, multilateral development banks. I'm in constant exchange with President Akao of, of ADB and, and, also, and the others in, in the IDB for Latin America and the Africans and the Islamic Bank and EBRD in London, which, where we are shareholders. But you are right. Uh, we have the ambition and also meet, must meet the expectation mm -hmm. of our shareholders that we are a very lean bank. Uh, this balance sheet of all close to 600 billion euros and the annual lending of 85 billion is done with a little over 3,000 people. EBRD in London, which where we are shareholders and which does a fantastic job in the field, does one tenth of our balance sheet with 2,000 people. And the World Bank and IFC are probably at, at 18,000 people or so. But they have a different work to be done. And I, that's why I don't criticize them. They have a very granular portfolio they need to do the development work, work on the ground in, in difficult countries around the world. So it's easy to say that when you're sitting at the desks in Luxembourg and have only 100 people all in all outside of Luxembourg, that you can be much more efficient. It would completely un be unfair vis-a-vis -vis those banks I've mentioned. On AIB and NDB, we indeed have an interesting case. Before AIB was founded, the potential founders pilgrimaged frequently to Luxembourg and we had a lot of exchange. We also had the opportunity to, to send some people there because uh, we saw that basically AIIB and NDB could be considered as a fundamental attack of uh, emerging markets and in particular China uh, against the Bretton Woods institutions and some of the countries involved in NDB a little bit disappointed by the, way, the, by the way they were treated in the multilateral development banks and the uh, global context. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that they cop are able to cooperate with us, even co-finance with us very closely. And therefore, we were ready to give advice. And you know, you have a setup with AIB, for instance, which is to a large extent a copy of what we do. And that will enable us to, to cooperate very, very well. Because uh, we have uh, in the European Union, and we are bound by EU regulation, very tough standards when it comes to social criteria, to environmental criteria, to cr procurement criteria. Uh, and that is sometimes a big problem in, in the, the cooperation of, of the EU bank with uh, governments around the world. For instance, when they have local content rules, which are simply not acceptable for us, but they're needed there, then it comes to clashes. Or they have, they're driven by resident boards, which keep the management busy from morning to night. Uh, and for instance, uh, AIB decided against the resident board, and they have a structure where the board members um, uh, regularly travel to the, the headquarters. These are things where we have uh, cooperated very well. We have now welcomed them in the group of the multilateral development banks. So you, you know these meetings at least twice a year or three times a year in Davos. Uh, they cooperate there now, and uh, I think they are a great addition to the, this, this, this family, just like the inclusion of the Islamic Development Bank is, is a good thing. Uh, we are not only devoted multilateralists, but also devoted cooperators. And I believe that if we cooperate well with 
all the other multilateral banks, we can produce the maximum win-win. Uh, well, thank you very much. I think a uh, round of applause is... Thank you.